Okay, we'll be starting about a minute. Uh, it's really amazing, the audiences recently. I guess you guys uh, don't have anything better to do. <laughs> no, but I'm glad you're here, really. Uh, Sign Circle has been a wonderful place to be for um, 12 years now. Oh, okay, more, more advertising. Plus, this is a great place to be, uh, to have virtual uh, socializing. Yeah, well, that's what I thought, you know, with the pandemic. But it's, it, if people can come back to Second Life or uh, find out what 3D virtual worlds can do and with the VW uh, best practices in education conference just recently. Um, okay, hey, uh, I am going to do both voice and chat, see if I can do that same time here. So I've got a little script going. Most of the stuff I will say will be uh, in script. Um, so let's begin. Is welcome to uh, the science circle uh, for people that have been here forever and people who this may be new to. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Hendricks, and it, and it seems like quite a while, if you've been in social isolation, but a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Robert Hendricks presented us a, a detailed look at what we know about the virus that's behind the current epidemic. And um, a lot uh, has happened since then. So today uh, we will revisit what's been going on with the pandemic at several levels. Okay. So, now let's take a look at the future. I mean, it's kind of hard to see sometimes um, what we may have ahead of us. So let's take a look at, at the future and what we know right now, what's happened, what we know, and how we might um, know what's going on. Next. Okay, so uh, here's what I envision happening today. Uh, first of all, please, uh, no blaming. In other words, I don't want to see, you know, blah, blah, name uh, or country or whatever like that. Because one thing to remember is that, it, uh, yes, there are influ influential people and such, but uh, frankly, it takes millions of people to create a pandemic. It can't be uh, started by one person. And it's a very critical time to look at this whole thing today um, because people are starting to be really itchy about uh, getting back to normal, whatever that means. So let's take a look at basically uh, what the next months will look like, um, what the, in other words, what the data says, what science says, what uh, we can do, the psych psychological aspects of this, uh, as far as um, creating the future. Um, for those that have not gotten the, the note card yet uh, there's a there's a ball right behind the blue circle and you can take a look at uh, it and just since we are recording the notes let me just uh, put that on there for you is go ahead and click on the ball to get uh, some notes uh, thank you to widget and mark for uh, making that up for us okay today i'd like to um take a look at three aspects of the pandemic. And uh, one is an update with the facts and figures. In other words, let's, let's take a look at what the facts and figures say. Let's take a look at then what does the data show and how reliable it is. Let's take a look at what uh, is happening from a scientific standpoint. And how does, in other words, how does this Z play, play out? What can we do at each point? And how are we reacting? How do people think? In other words, what people think uh, about science and uh, each other. Now, right now, my, um, okay. So first of all, though, this isn't just a presentation. I love to have uh, feedback from the audience. And I would like the audience to interact. In other words, the whole purpose of being here is not just for me. I could have uh, put something online if all we were doing was a presentation. So what I'd like you to do is, if you would like, 
is, and for people that have been in Science Circle presentations before, they'll know this very well, but the idea is please share your experiences. Uh, say things like, how is it where you are? Uh, what are you doing? How do you feel about this? In other words, feel free to interact in nice ways, right? Okay. <laughs> in other words, I already mentioned, let's not blame people. There's plenty of time for doing that kind of stuff. Let's uh, take a look at what's going on. Uh, please feel free to like uh, share links or sources or ask questions and answer questions that people ask, that sort of thing. Um, this is a wonderful time. We've got probably an international audience for sure. And uh, it's a wonderful time to be uh, humans together and to get through this together. And we could do that. Okay, so let's take a look first of all, kind of what does data show that's happening? And what I'd like to do is uh, rather than just talk, I'll show you. Okay, so let's, uh, so what's happened over the last few months? Uh, and so let's take a look at, like, look at this. Oh, well, <laughs> that, yeah, that's good. I try to, I try to have kind of lively uh, chats with my students. I teach a telecom class. I retired last summer, but I still teach classes. Uh, so um, I've at least had some, a little bit of fun with doing this. Okay, let's take a look over here is what I've got. Now, you may uh, uh, have some issue with trying to follow me uh, where the, we are earthlings. Yes, we are. Okay, so where the sound is coming from, hopefully that won't cause a problem here as I kind of show you what's going on here. But if you look, um, the reason why this is, first of all, and I actually saw this in the news, but the reason why this is called, anyone know, hey, I, I could ask a question. Anyone know why this is called COVID-19? I know not everybody can hear. That's why I'm putting it in text. But before I put the answer, uh, somebody tell me what, why. Yeah, okay. I actually heard in the news somewhere that somebody was saying it's the 19th co co coronavirus. No, it's because it, uh, they name them via the year when the first cases. So the first uh, cases uh, that were known anyway, uh, I got a misspell in there, um, came out in uh, 2019. Okay, so in 2019, um, abs yeah, absolutely. Okay, so by the way, the virus is a is actually called SARS-CoV-2. It's just, it's kind of like the first SARS virus, um, which means, uh, you know, severe acute uh, respiratory syndrome. Okay, so at the end of 2019, uh, where I am, yeah, absolutely, that's that's why. It's got a little crown-looking shape, kind of like the first... Um, well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why I wanted to confirm that, is because it was in 2019. That's why they call it that. Now, there's lots of coronaviruses, and uh, Dr. Hendricks, a couple of weeks ago, explained some of the things about, yeah, why 3K problem series. Uh, which, by the way, uh, uh, we'll, we could always revisit that. Technology is actually my uh, background. Um, but uh, at the end of the circle which I'm standing on right now is uh, for 1 January. And actually on the 31st of December, or 30, uh, China reported to the World Health Organization that they had a cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan province. province. And... Um, within the week, they recognized that uh, there was something peculiar about the uh, about the uh, cases, and they were just uh, regular uh, pneumonia, for example. Now, by mid-January, which is the next little circle here, is that uh, other countries were starting to report. In other words, by here. Um, other countries were starting to report uh, cases of what would be called COVID-19. Now, by the 1st of February, which is the next little circle up, you can see, by the way, the height of the circles represents what it is for you guys that are interested, is the circle is uh, in one and a half degrees is every day, 
And uh, each of the circles, the height of the circles represents the number of cases that were detected at that time. So in the 1st of February, China had at least 12,000 cases and their first, unfortunately, their first death due to complications from the disease. Okay, by mid-February, which is the blue one because uh, people were starting to notice that this was not something that was um, uh, just normal. For example, in the United States, where I am, uh, the first case was on January 20th. And so by mid-February, several countries were starting to see spikes in the number of cases. And it was kind of alarming, if you remember, it wasn't that long ago. If you remember, there were spikes in Iran and in Italy and, and places like that. And so by the beginning of Mars, uh, excuse me, by the beginning of March, there were 88,000 cases and it was spreading uh, throughout the world. So uh, people really started to take notice of what was going on here. Okay. So uh, things happened rather quickly after that is that in mid-March, the World Health Organization, or WHO, um, officially declared this a pandemic. Now, I think it's important to understand what a pandemic is. Let me go over to the pandemic one here. Okay, I think it's important to understand what a pandemic is, is, and I'll put it up here, is a pandemic is an infectious disease that is no longer really under control and that is spreading globally throughout the world. So an epidemic is local and not a pandemic. Uh, does anyone else now, I like to ask questions, and I like comments, is, does anyone know what the other pandemic that is going on in the world right now, um, official pandemic that's been going on for some time, in other words, a couple, a few decades? Not Ebola. Ebola tends to be, the reason uh, uh, Ebola tends to be an epidemic rather than a pandemic is because it's highly lethal. In other words, the people that get it either die or uh, live and it isn't spread like this one. And it's, um, wow, I got a lot of things. And, and actually, William, I see that right. Okay. So you have HIV and AIDS, which one is AIDS is the actual disease part of that. And it's still a very infectious, uh, particularly in South Africa, up to 25% or 29% in the case of women who are pregnant, uh, it can be, uh, lethal. Uh, yes. Uh, well, <laughs> okay. Obesity is another <laughs> situation. Okay. Um, and yes. Okay. Now the other things, when you talk about things like meningitis and stuff, notice that, for example, cancer is worldwide also. There's a lot of things. And so, okay. And thank you, Aaron. I'm not a doctor like Dr. Hendricks. So I do like to be, if I say something wrong or say something that's not quite correct or that can be clarified, please. Uh, that's one of the reasons I love to come to these presentations because we have people from all over the world and I learn a lot uh, uh, by, by doing this. Okay. So yes, that has not been eradicated and it's still very, uh, HIV AIDS is still a, a very big thing in uh, many parts of the world with a, a lot of um, uh, effect. Okay, so, but in this case, if you remember back in February, uh, pe the people were still saying, wow, we need to get this thing under control. And of course we didn't. Um, and so it became a pandemic. Now, things, once it became, one, uh, and then it really took off. And I'm going to do a little magic that you can do in Second Life here. So I'm going to walk up to here. And this is represents that uh, beginning of April. Let me see. I think I need to get to my next slide here. Let me see what we got. Yeah. Okay. So this is this represents what is going on now, and you can see. Uh, by the way, I took this information uh, about three hours ago, and the reason I had to re uh, to revise it was because I took it last night and there were already 40,000 more deaths and, and around the world and other places since last night. And so uh, things are really uh, taking off uh, uh, significantly. Okay, so by 
April, cases of COVID-19 were increasing exponentially all over the world. And we're only talking about a few um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it was in the beginning of April, for example, that the U.S. became the country with the most cases, only 200,000. Now, if you look on the board there, you'll see that we're in the United States, it's up to 706,000. So it went from 200,000 to 706,000 in just a couple of weeks in the, in the U.S. Okay, in other words, since uh, Dr. Hendrickson. Now I'm going to do one more little piece of magic here um, that you can do in Second Life. Okay, and so now we're up to, uh, hopefully you can still hear me up here. And so now we're at where we're at now. In other words, on the 18th of April, and uh, just a couple of weeks later from the beginning of April, um, we're up to, good, okay, so we're up to 2 million or over it now, you can see on, on the board. And as I mentioned, cases in the United States have ballooned from uh, 200,000 to 700,000, which is as much as the next four countries uh, combined. Okay, so now let's see if I can do the same thing without uh, falling down. I had to practice this last night here. Okay. Yeah. Hey, it worked. Okay, great. Coming down. Great. Okay. And so, well, that's a very good point. The asymptomatic carriers, and I've heard uh, everything from uh, quarter to um, 50%, okay? Uh, so that that's rather alarming because that means that there are a lot of people out there that have this that don't know perhaps that they have it and that may still be contagious. Yeah, uh, Baragon, that's uh, uh, thank you. Okay, now uh, that's another story, and and here again, I, in this particular presentation, I don't want to name names. I mean, that's where I'm at. <laughs> okay, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, it's not the virus. I just caught. Okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, the idea is what will happen next, though, because you can see the the figures and such. Um, but what will happen next? Well, one thing that is kind of interesting is if you don't just look at the cases, which are still going up exponentially. In other words, where will we be next? Is there is some good news in this? Uh, it's always good. Here again, I like to see. Yeah, uh, I have. Let's see. Antibody test suggests that to a number of effect. Well, that's exactly correct. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. In other words, we're going to talk about what the data can show us, and what kind of reliability the data shows us, and that sort of thing. So, in many places in the world, it appears that there are new cases. Uh, the new cases each day may have peaked or even decreasing. And to make it clear, I kind of have a model of the daily deaths since, um, or the da or the daily, that shouldn't say deaths, sorry, the daily cases in Italy. Um, okay, so let me, let me show you what that would look like. In other words, rather than just look like at a graph, I like to have, this is second life after all, it's a 3D world and so, uh, we should be able to uh, show things in 3D. So let me trot this out for just a second here, and we'll take a look at, at this. Okay, so what this is, is this is a view, and here again, the heights represent the number of new cases a day. And um, over here, I am at beginning of March, and then, so okay, so the trend is clear in some cases. Like for example, with 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 here, and so we're here at the beginning of March, and so now within a week, we're we're at this level here as far as the number of uh, new cases, and then wow, another week it's it's here, another week it's way up here as far as the number of daily cases, and then it starts to uh, level off a bit. In other words, if you actually look at the numbers, uh, it's like wow, okay, they haven't, and then the next week, ooh. Uh, it's actually going down and maybe stabilizing a little bit. And then today, in other words, this, in this last week, we're 
actually seeing a trend downward for the number of new cases in Italy. And you can see that here uh, in the graph behind me as well as uh, my little uh, visual uh, presentation. Let me put this away for a second so you can see the slides. Well, well, thank you. I was I was hoping that <laughs> that was kind of fun. I had to rehearse a little bit and play with it, but um, it's 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 kind of fun to do that. Okay, so let me get uh, seated here, and we'll get back to business. Um, yeah, but it is, and and you're right. In some cases, it looks like it's a geometrical progression. And as I was mentioning, the trend is clear in some countries than others. You can see on the slide in the back that in some cases, like for example, let's just take a look at the slide, is like for example, worldwide, that's on the bottom left there, you can see that it's not going up as fast, but is it still going up or is it, um, it's not quite sure. Uh, same thing with the one in the United States. It's very difficult to tell what's happening. It just hasn't, uh, we just haven't had, in other words, it, uh, it, it's been going up for a while. It's very hard to tell what's going on. Uh, Spain, which is the bottom one with the question mark next to the word what, what's going on there? In other words, it's coming down, and then all of a sudden there was a little bit going up. In other words, are, I don't know what's going on there. You, in other words, you have to have more information. The one in the middle there, the reason I picked Italy was it was pretty clear that it's been trending downward. And in Iran, it's hard to tell on there because it looks like it's going up and then it comes down. And then, you, yeah, you would have to either do a, say, five day, um, uh, what do they call it? I'm trying to remember what the, the term is, but basically it's a, a, a five, yeah, very good. I knew, hey. I knew, see, I can always count on the audience to repaying, et cetera. Exactly. I can always count on the audience about what's going on. So now the thing is in the United States, for example, is because each of the states is almost like a little country in its own. And because they handle things differently and have different population densities and demographics and stuff, projected peaks in the different states in the United States range from the 30th of March, in other words, already passed, to 7 May, which of course isn't anywhere near. And so we're kind of in the middle. If you actually count the number of states that the peak has passed, including today, uh, versus the ones which they project coming up, we're about in the middle. Uh, this is, okay, uh, good question is this is new cases, not deaths. And I, and that's a perfect segue, by the way, into uh, the next thing. So let me go to the next slide here. Okay, so what does the data tell us? Let's take a look. Let's take a look. So you can read the slide as well as I can. But let's take a look at some of the types of things that uh, are that we can tell from the data. Uh, well, that's a very good question. Are we going into a second spike? And here again, I didn't prompt the audience. These are great questions because I will be answering them in the presentation here. So hang loose and I will uh, answer your, your questions, not just answer them, I'll actually show you, okay, from the data. Okay, so it's important to understand the terms. And if you take a look at the terms there, you can see, but one of the things that we can absolutely tell, well, curious minds wanna know, that, no, 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 that's, that's good. That that shows you guys are, in other words, we're all thinking alike on this thing. That's important. Remember, we have a global audience here. It's not just one little place. That's why I love to uh, come to presentations here and to share things because we do have, in other words, I want to know what other people are thinking uh, along the line and stuff. Uh, well, uh, are 90 percent of people complying with distancing? I would say in some countries, yes, and in other countries, yeah. So it all depends on, on where you're at. Okay. So the conclusion, though, we can draw is, is that what you saw there are minimum numbers, as was yeah. And so what? So what uh, somebody put in there are now open. <laughs> 
Well, they were also open during spring break, and so all the kids came back and infected their parents. Now, that's not data. That's just what I thought. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and th there again, okay, here again, let's let's try. Uh, I know we've, we've, we've mentioned Texas, California, and Florida. Let's, what I would like to do right at this point is go, let's not blame or say particular things. In other words, let's talk about the science. Let's talk about the psychology. But let's not give, because otherwise we'll start being putting names in there. Ah, okay, so Aaron shared that it's really bad uh, just south of New York City. Okay, so let's keep it to science and to psychology, but try to avoid, in other words, generalize a little bit with trying to avoid. The only thing I've done, and I apologize uh, if um, it uh, didn't measure my, I mean, it didn't live up my rules, is I mentioned the United States. But I didn't mention anything in particular. I just mentioned uh, general uh, trends and things you can see from data. Okay. The other conclusion is that conclusions are only as good as the data. <laughs> okay. So let's take a look then is how can science inform us of what we might expect in the data? And how can psychology inform us? Yeah, uh, this is the science circle. However, psychology is also the science of people. And so, well, the, well, no, that's, that's psychology. It's, it's absolutely, you're right. The compulsive desire to open up economies is definitely relevant to the psychology. So it's not just a science problem. It's not just a data problem. In fact, as I mentioned before, this is a pandemic, is a social event, not just a medical event. And that people collectively and individually can um, make an enormous uh, contribution to what happens next. What is our future? Well, <laughs> do we have any impulse control? <laughs> I'm not sure that, that uh, but you're absolutely correct. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, so in other words, why did we have to, if you think about it, why did we, ha why did some countries have to resort to heavy, what some people might call heavy-handed measures. The reason being is we don't have a lot of impulse control, um, and we tend to, and in some countries, it's <laughs> it's um, worse than in others. So, for example, there are at least two countries, and I won't name them, I'm just saying there are two countries, you can look it up too, uh, that have no official cases because they're not permitted to put it in the press or use those things. So you'll see actually there's two countries, big countries. I'm there, by the way, if you actually want to know, there's a, like 185, 187 uh, countries and places that are infected. There's 195 countries or places that, in the world. So there are some islands that still are not infected, but there's also two countries, which are definitely not islands, that officially have no cases simply because uh, they're not allowed to uh, use those terms in the press or anywhere else. Okay. Um, well, and we'll talk a little bit. Uh, <laughs> don't mention countries. <laughs> okay, but that's actually not one of the ones I was thinking of because they are reported. Now, on the other hand, and I won't mention names here, is that there is evidence that countries in several parts of the world are underreporting. In other words, these numbers are just the minimum. So why do you think that this might be the case, that there's people that may be underreporting? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you're right. Uh, except I want to be, uh, you're, you're right. In other words, just naming whatever. But the idea is that once we start naming, then you start naming people and stuff like that. And last time, for example, we've got a little bit out of control because people started kind of uh, picking back at each other like as if this is social media. Uh, is Second Life social media? Well, kind of. But on the other hand, there's no com And we do have, we have comments? Well, of course. <laughs> but let's, uh, but the idea is I wanted to just try to minimize a tiny bit the actual naming of places and stuff like that. Uh, okay, there you go. Underreporting so they escape blame. In other words, um, <laughs> yeah, okay. But the, the, in other words, the idea is, of course you don't want 
high numbers. Because what does that look like? That looks like people, either the government's not doing their job or people aren't doing their job. So it looks bad, right? And so if you massage the numbers a little bit, um, and ooh, very good, underreporting to avoid panic. Obviously with my, obviously prestige, all of those sorts of things. So if you look at my little visualization there, you'll see that, oh my goodness, this is getting uh, high and uh, that would cause panic. In other words, the idea uh, that um, this is getting out of control and people really can't. So for example, there are lots of ways that people do to try to hold it under control, uh, both in numbers and in what they tell us to do and stuff like that. So let's take a look at this. What can science say? Well, here again, um, you can read the slide, but let's see what we, we can say. Okay. Okay. So one thing we know is this is not the flu. Yes, hoard toilet pen, yeah. Um, okay, hey, there was a, uh, whoops, uh, let's see, I guess, no, nah, I, I won't say it because I, I'd be blaming. Okay, so in any case, what we know is it, this is not the flu, okay? It acts differently. So we don't know, for example, whether it will die out in summer or whether it will recur or whatever. Just we're not there yet. We do know that there's a lot of different kind of coronaviruses. We can take our lead from, yeah, mutation is, and it's already mutated, by the way, and it does. Um, and it will. But it's not the Black Death either. Very good to say that. In the last presentation, too, uh, <laughs> they thought uh, that exactly. Um, and, ooh, now, it, I've also heard that it does mutate slowly, which is good. Uh, here again, I'm not uh, putting in too much science here. We have limited time, but I would. But if I see something in there, I'll comment. And it is not the Black Death. In other words, and I'll actually, you guys are really good at this stuff because I'm going to show you something a little bit later here too, having to do with like um, influ 1918 influenza epi epi or pandemic, that sort of thing. The Black Death, for example, killed about 200 million people. But then again, there weren't that many people on Earth, you know, over in Europe at that time. So that was between a third and um, half of um, the people. That greatly changed a lot, including psychology for a long period of time. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I, I guess if you want to be a kind of rosy optimist about this, it could be worse, <laughs> which it could be. Okay. Now, one of the things we do know is that the environment, and this is kind of tongue in cheek here, a subset of people who pay attention to science. Well, you're right. <laughs> Not everybody does. And that's something uh, the, the rats are starving this pandemic. Yep, the viruses aren't, the rats are. Okay, so what we do know is that viruses don't care if it's mid April or May. Or so setting goals like that is kind of not very realistic unless you have something to base it on. I'm not saying names. Okay, I'm just saying that uh, viruses don't have a calendar. Okay. The other thing, the thing, the other thing we do know is that the virus will do what it does. In other words, it will spread. Uh, whoa, what was the question here? There was another one. If you test, oh, yes, actually, that was one of the things that I was going to get to here, is we don't know that. We don't know, uh, we know, obviously, there are people who have recovered, in fact, hundreds of thousands of people have recovered, um, but we don't know whether they can get it again, uh, all that sort of stuff like that. Those are all, speaking of scary, I mean, that's all the stuff, uh, those are the types of things. The problem is, is we don't know those um, we do know that the virus will do what viruses do. It will spread until it's either localized. In other, in other words, it's um, in areas that, for example, if you talk about malaria, uh, malaria is localized to different parts of the world because that's where uh, mosquitoes that are infected live. Okay. Um, however, it kills a lot of people, like a million people a year, if I'm not mistaken. Localized also means that uh, there's not a lot of contact between different people. So we can do that, and there's a, there's a couple good ways to do that, to localize it. Uh, same thing with um, uh, things like uh, smallpox. Smallpox 
was uh, tracked, uh, localized, uh, vaccine, and uh, essentially eradicated. Okay, the virus also will infect either everybody. In other words, if it's not localized, it will affect everybody, or it'll mutate into something less virulent or infected. Or yeah, infection. Infective. Um, Okay, now herd immunity would be preferable to, yeah, okay, I agree absolutely 100%. In other words, herd immunity by a vaccine would be preferable to herd immunity by infection. Now, you'll get it. <laughs> oh, in other words, one way or another, the, this, is, this is not um, politics, this is uh, nature, okay? And we don't have a lot of say over that. We can understand what's going on, but the virus is going to do what the virus does. We do know, for example, that the only way to localize, and you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the only way to localize the virus is to know who's infected. So the only way to know who's infected is what? Well, we don't know if people had it, have immunity. They're thinking test, 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 absolutely. And that wasn't just a test of the... Uh, chat room there that was uh yeah okay so testing in other words we have to know you can't just guess and go oh you got a fever ah, that that's an indicator but then uh the the flu uh, this year was particularly bad as well and there's lots of things that can happen so the only way to really know uh bronchitis the whole bit absolutely the fe fever of course as we know is a way your body has a ratcheting up your temperature, which tends to kill off uh, buggies like that. Okay, what we do know is that social uh, I distancing and isolation decrease the number of contacts. Yeah, and that's the other problem. In other words, unless you pretty much, you, in other words, you can't just go up to somebody and go, oh, wow, they're not coughing, so I guess they don't have it, um, or stuff like that. Yeah, and so um, we do, <laughs> those are things we actually do know. So what can past epidemics tell us? Well, I would venture to say, and here again, um, if you have a different way of looking at it, I more than, uh, okay, now I'll tell you something that I know about masks coming up and about possibly their effectiveness or not. But one of the things we do know is humans haven't changed much in the last century, <laughs> either physically uh, yeah, and uh, let's let's take a look at the mass here when we get to um, uh, some of that. Okay, so mask may uh, is that humans have not changed much physically or socially over the last century. So therefore, one pandemic, in other words, how do we react and such, may inform another. So among the scary side here, let me just uh, give you some things about the. Um, oh, really? Wow, that would be interesting if that last November, see, because, ooh, okay, because that's another thing is when were the first cases? Okay, it's the same. If you remember, speaking of HIV AIDS, uh, they didn't know that there were first cases until quite a while, until they recognized it, right? Okay, so now let's take a look at what could happen um, from the scary standpoint. Okay, this is worst case scenario. If you look at the right-hand side, you will see information from a bulletin that was put out by uh, New York City um, in October of 19th. And, yeah, um, in October of 19th. And if you'll read that, you will see that, you will see that they basically were telling people exact same thing that they're telling us now. Look at that, wash the face and hands, avoid gatherings, uh, it, it spreads mainly by inhaling some of the tiny droplets of germ-laden uh, mucus, etc., like that. Uh, so, yeah, and so the idea is um, that it was highly infectious, and if I'm correct, here again, it was 1918, they didn't have the communication stuff we had today. It was about, had a similar mortality rate of this virus, okay? It was not too different. Now, on the other hand, if you look at SARS-1 and MERS that have occurred in the last 20 years, you'll find out they were much, 
more virulent and they didn't uh, travel near as far as this one. So they probably were not as infect, uh, um, infectious uh, and they uh, caused more deaths. Whereas this one is kind of very infectious and does not cause, uh, mortality rate is not terribly high. Um, but on the left curve, for example, is, let me just put this information into chat so it's recorded in chat. Is essentially on the left. Well, and that's exactly right. In other words, a, a virulent diseases don't spread very much. There are some that are much worse than even a, a Ebola. And the idea is that if they kill too soon, they kill the host too soon, they're not going to spread because they, they can't go far enough. Well, and, and you're absolutely correct, okay, Sumo, is that, uh, in other words, um, now, when you say bodily fluids, droplets that come from your mouth or nose or stuff are bodily fluids, but I know what you're talking about. In other words, the transmission and stuff like that is a little different. Okay. Um, well, okay, th that's another one. Here again is, does it stay active as long as on cardboard? My understanding is that, does anyone know, since uh, here again, I, I don't like to just hear myself talk, what substance have they found that the virus is not? In other words, that actually kills the virus uh, fairly soon. In other words, ah, very good, copper, absolutely, four hours. They found that that, uh, you, uh, okay, UV, and I've heard that um, UV, I've heard yeah, off and on. Here again, I'm not a doctor. I'm reporting stuff. I'm more of a researcher. Copper-infused mass, things like that, absolutely. Now, I've heard cardboard's about a day. I wouldn't bet your life on it, things like that. Uh, I have heard that uh, hard surfaces like plastics and stuff. Um, well, that's why I said you these to debatable and such. Um, and then hard surfaces and such, it can stay on there for days. Okay. So now let's take a look then at this. This next slide, I find particularly copper is the winner. I, in this next slide, I find particularly kind of alarming because look at the time period. First of all, look at the time period on here. This is a two-month period, and it's over. It's a two-month period, and it shows the deaths here. This isn't just cases. It shows the deaths per day in New York City at the time. Notice that it was also, uh, since it was the flu, uh, the uh, pneumonia was a big deal. Like, for example, I have a pneumonia vaccine, so hopefully I won't get pneumonia. That sort of thing. Been vaccinated. Okay, but let's take a look at this. That middle curve is a second wave. That's the one that killed most people in 1918. If you look at it, uh, the most lethal part of the flu in was in the fall of 1918. If you study the uh, 1918 epidemic, you'll find that the timeline is kind of similar. In other words, the first cases were somewhere in January, and then it really started to uh, get, uh, you, you could see that in that it ramped up a little bit in March. Recall at this time that, of course, this was World War I. There, and so uh, there was a first a wave uh, in March. There was a much bigger wave. Yes, you're exactly, yeah, absolutely. Yes. In other words, the, the circumstances were very different. And so the second wave is what you see from September, November. And because this was the flu, it came back in the winter and a third wave occurred. And so you have a little different uh, situation. And so let me put this into chat here. Is it essentially where there were three waves and it wasn't uh, really kind of faded out until the summer of uh, 2019. Now note that for a, a century ago, there were several things that were different than now. And I'm gonna put them up here. One was, there was not the medical assistance that we have today. And there was no real containment like social distancing. Now, they did find, by the way, without mentioning cities, there were some cities that had parades for war bonds and stuff like that. They were much more affected than cities that didn't have large parades 
and that more or less did practice a little bit of uh, social uh, containment. Um, yeah, lots of interesting. Yeah, it, well, there, there's a city. <laughs> okay, so yeah, absolutely. Um, and then co uh, communication was also it, what we didn't have all this social media and comments and all this stuff like that, which could be good or bad. Communication was by telephone and or written. Radio is a new technology. And road systems were primitive and no commercial airlines. So you couldn't get to another place to spread. Oh, thank you. Good. Uh, OK, so you couldn't get to another place to uh, spread stuff. Um, yeah, it took, a, <laughs> it took a while for ships to go like and, and cruise liners. Yes, OK. 56? Holy cow. OK. That's a, that's a lot. Now, all of the differences here resulted in kind of a, uh, hopefully something that we'll never see with this one, was that as a result, essentially, of the, of the different waves and uh, less medicine and all that, and the close conditions and stuff, was the result was about a third or more of the world's population was infected and over 50 million died. Remember, we're just up to 2 million cases right now. So hopefully we will never see something like this. Uh, yeah, I've actually heard up to 100 million. In other words, I just put 50 million because that was kind of conservative. But then again, see, we don't know because uh, the different parts of the world, there wasn't the reporting mechanisms and stuff that we had today. So we really don't know. OK, so let's go back to, yeah. So let's go back to uh, what science uh, can tell us. Here again, you can read the slide as well as I can. However, uh, and you've probably heard a lot of this, but let's take a look at some of the important parts that uh, are on, uh, that we know that can inform the data. For example, when you have, in other words, they talk about cases versus new cases, versus deaths and all that stuff. And so, that's a point of this one. Uh, yeah, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, Nero. And that's kind of what, without uh, kind of shoving into you guys' faces, that's what I was trying to get uh, there. <laughs> it, and well, it's not necessarily age related. It's it's vulner. It, in other words, it's immune system related, right? And also, what sorts of medical complications? In other words. Uh, we would like to think, in other words, people that are younger, that's a, that's actually part of the psychology there, is that we would like to think that older people, like me, um, are somehow more susceptible to this stuff. And it's just simply because as you age, you, your immune system. However, I go play out in the yard a lot, and I've got dogs and stuff, so I would venture to say my immune system might be better than some of you guys'. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I, I might stack mine up against yours sometime. Okay, so in any case, the problem is is that symptoms don't always show up immediately after infection. So you, so in other words, what does it mean by new cases or total cases? In other words, there's a lot of people, and there's already hint, yeah, eat dirt. Well, you know, there is something to be said with that, is cleanliness is not necessarily a good medicine all the time. Um, we tend to be, in some cases, a little too clean, and, uh, and and in other words, we don't expose ourselves to some of the things that can help our immunity. And then, yeah, absolutely, asthma or any kind of respiratory ailments or heart ailments seem to be not so good, besides not like the floor. Uh, yeah, I don't know about this amphitheater. There's been a lot of people out here. I wouldn't have your uh, uh, avatar lick, lick the floor here. I don't think we uh, cleaned it up. <laughs> Uh, Matt, we, I think we sweep the amphitheater after in between sessions here, but I don't know that I would lick the floor. Okay, so what we do know is that now on the positive thing, and I always like to put positive stuff too, is that we do know this, is we do know that 90, in other words, even if you get it, 90 to 90% 90 of people who are infected survive. Um, but what does that mean? And we don't need an animation for that. Um, what does that mean? Well, you know, if you have 100 million people and 90% of people survive, or even 99%, you're still talking millions of people that die. 
And so do, do we want that? Do we want it to be uh, another 1918 uh, epid- uh, pandemic? I don't think so. Um, a lot of us, of course, don't think we're going to be the one that catches it or dies, right? Um, but one of the things we also know is there are no miracle cures, or at least we don't know of any, okay? I'll put it that way. And that the only thing, in other words, there's a lot of people that would love to uh, find some chemicals or things that they can do or whatever to uh, prevent them from getting it and other people from getting it. But right now, we don't know of any miracle cures. And the only thing that we know for sure is minimizing contact with infected people and minimizing getting the virus inside you is a really good way to minimize trying to catch this. Thing. Okay. Uh, now, okay, culling the herds. Okay, I actually heard somebody in uh, two weeks ago, and I'm not going to name names, but two two weeks ago there was somebody who actually, and I don't know whether they were joking or not, but they basically said, "Well, why don't we just let you know let the uh, old people and the homeless and uh, that sort of thing die off, um, so that we can get back to work?" Okay. The problem with that is you don't know if you're going to be the one that dies off, okay? Uh, there is no, <laughs> there. you can't say that this group or that group or whatever. There's a lot of people, yeah, he could volunteer for that one first, great. Okay, go go, go um, test it, and if you come out okay, great, uh, if not. But that's the problem. Uh, we don't know enough about this one. Um, yeah, and you're, and you're right is is the humanity so i'm actually getting into the psychology part here in a second and i want to i want to take a little bit of time so i'm going to roar through this one essentially you guys know all this stuff right in other words if you have no social distancing that's not great and if you have it then uh and if you do do some social distancing one of the things you can do is at least give people a chance to get uh exactly and my granddaughter is an ER nurse, okay? And she tells us all the time, uh, well, I'm watching the time here a little bit. The psych- what, what actually happens, and that's a very good thing, the cytokine or cytokine storm is what happens with that is that you could be doing fairly well, and then your immune system can kick in and... It can, much like um, allergies, in other words, an allergy is kind of your immune system kicking in. Well, in the cytokine storm thing, people that look like they're doing pretty well, they start getting antibodies and their immune system kicks in, and then all of a sudden it kind of starts doing stuff in your body that uh, makes you worse, and you can die from it, from this the cytokine or cytokine storm, okay? Um (laughs) <laughs> what does my granddaughter RN say? Well, she's been a she's been an ER nurse for like a decade, and she says it's not good. Okay, there's a lot of there's lots of stuff. She said she's seen more deaths in just the last few weeks than she's seen in her whole career. Um, I won't tell you where she's at. I know, um, but she's being safe. She's a smart person, um, and so she's being safe. Okay, now one thing though, let's take a look then at the kind of the psychology because I'd really like to get a little bit of information on here. Here's some stuff I've put up is that we are human. So it's kind of inter, ad, inter, or under, it's important to understand how we react to this thing, okay? So think about it. What are we being asked to do? And I know I know people believe in science, and, and I'm an adherent of science, too. But if you think about it, for people that don't, they're being asked to believe in something they can't see. In other words, these viruses. It's not like it, this is a movie, and when you're infected, you cough blood or turn into a zombie. Is in some cases, they're, you know, you don't. And so, well... Uh, and Baragon, I, I know that cost benefit analysis thing is is something that really kind of gets me. 
And so in other words, uh, but that's how some, and the reason why I, I wanted to have this presentation at this time is we're starting to think about this in terms of cost benefit analysis. And you're right, too many people, in other words, the idea, ooh, very good, thank you for all of those uh, links. Uh, here again, there's, there's, uh, there's the note card and then there's just tons of links. I've been capturing uh, links and articles for very much time. Well, you know, I watched the moon landing and there were people at that time that, that, that said, nah, it's a, it's a Hollywood stage. Or somebody actually said, well, they may have landed on a moon, but not the moon I see up there, you know, that kind of stuff. So there's always that. But the idea is, if you think about it, without judging people, we are being asked to believe in things we can't see. We're being able to, we're being asked in uh, to believe people, what people tells us. And so who do we believe? Do we believe the scientists? Do we believe the politicians? Do we believe the media? Uh, all of that stuff like that. And then the other thing we're being asked to believe is in data and projections of when we can get back to normal. And think of the costs. If, if you want to talk about cost benefit, think of the people that um, are highly affected, like people that have jobs, <laughs> that sort of thing. People that, uh, that sort of thing. So, the idea is a lot of this tells us about what do we value? Do we value well and, and, and uh, yeah, the triage thing. The problem is you don't want, see, the thing about the social distancing and stuff, and the reason why we have to do that, even if the cost is the fact that doctors are dying, uh, healthcare workers are dying, and you don't want them to have to triage. You don't want them to have to um, make a decision between the person next to you and you. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Sometimes I feel like shouting here too. <laughs> okay. Because I see a lot of really, uh, strange stuff. I know. And, and I see a lot of strange stuff and, and, um, going on. So what could people gain from this? Remember that we can, in every situation like that, we can, gain things from this. In other words, there are people that are manipulating this for various reasons, uh, for power. But we can also gain perhaps appreciation of what we have. I mean, the next time you actually get to do normal things, that's amazing. Uh, the next time you see a nurse or a doctor or a store a grocery bagger or people, a delivery person and stuff like that, I hope that you say thank you for your service the same way that people uh, who don't know anything about the military tell me that because of my military career. I mean, I hope that you'll, that people will. Now, I don't want to get into the soapbox stuff. I just am bringing up things having to do. Um, well, and that's the other thing. What will the new normal um, look like? One thing we can tell, though, is that a pandemic is a social event. In other words, what happens next? What happens in the next month? What happens in the next months is as much what the virus will do as what we do. And so do we want to go back to the new normal? What will be the new normal? Are we just going to go back to what we've been doing? Um, <laughs> I don't know about that, Eric. Okay, but are we just going to go back to the to to the normal we were in, or are we going to do another normal? Are we going to learn from this uh, in a way that no one ever has because we've never had a situation like quite like this, or are we just going to go back to normal? Okay, so I uh, having having had 22 years of teaching, I kind of got to where I know how long to talk here, and we're two minutes before the hour, so. What I'd like very much would be uh, exactly what you guys are doing. Ask questions, answer questions, uh, share experiences, uh, stick around. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. But um, I'm very glad you came. And I'm very glad that you're here to for me to learn about. Well, are we going to be in a, a great recession, a great depression? But remember that, um, in other words, do people in your neighborhood help each other? Do you even know your neighbors? In other words, in the Depression, 
people got together and if there was no money, they helped each other. Would we do that again? Or, or are we just going to go back to normal where you don't know your neighbors, you don't help out, you look after yourself? I'm not saying that's everywhere. There's a lot of places. Does anyone know a positive thing, in other words, from a social standpoint, like in Italy where they, you know, sang on the balconies or other people help? Okay, I think, I hope people will help each other. I hope people will get to know each other. I hope people will get, in other words, that we'll have a, a, a better world. Of course, I'm an optimist. <laughs> Sometimes I'm a pessimist, but down heart, I'm an optimist. Will we change schools? What about schools or, in other words, will there be more online stuff? Online's good to a point, but... There's there's upsides and downsides to everything. At least maybe we'll know how. <laughs> oh, really? Somebody brought you some toilet paper? How oh, nice. Okay. And there are some funny things on um, Facebook <laughs> and other places. <laughs> okay. Eat more health. Well, there, you know... Uh, I'm very interested, speaking from a medical standpoint, I'm interested to see whether, and somebody mentioned obesity, I'm interested to see that somebody was, uh, let's see, what did I see on Facebook that was running around? It was like, um, pandas eat a lot. When we're at home, we eat like pandas. That's why it's called a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, well, I'm going to quit blabbing, and I hope that you guys may stick around and, and talk and uh, share what's going on here again. Uh, uh, well, thank you. In other words, I'd be just talking to myself <laughs> if there weren't you out there. Thank you very much. You guys are um, you guys are wonderful. Stay safe, and we'll all get through this thing. Okay. Don't be a lemming. <laughs> Don't. In other words, do what you know's best. Don't just fall on the ground. Okay, take care. I'm going to uh, sign off here. I'll sit around uh, listening to you guys.